Hi, welcome to our unit on biological communication. This first lesson is going to deal with uh, the overall principles of communication that we see in biological systems. So I went with uh, these four pictures of this adorable baby girl because I think it's obvious to everybody who sees this, at least I hope so, that in each of these images the child is happy. She is communicating with us even though she doesn't really know that she's communicating with us. She's just broadcasting her happiness and we're able to see that. And that's because communication is fundamental to who we are as human beings and as living things more broadly. Communication is found all throughout the biological system and that's what this unit is going to deal with. Just like our last unit on regulation, we're going to look at different examples across various domains of the system in order to get a handle on the universal principles at work. The question that we're going to be dealing with in this video, since it's the overview video, is how do biological systems communicate? We're going to talk about what communication is for our definition, and we're going to look at some examples of biological communication. When we talk about communication, we're going to use the following framework when considering what we're talking about. I've represented with these two cartoon people, but they don't have to be cartoon people. It just makes it easy for this example. We're going to call the entity sending the communication the sender and the entity receiving the communication the receiver. Not the most original terms in the world. The thing that the sender is going to send to the receiver is going to be called the message. This is communication in pretty much any context, but certainly in the biological context. The thing to remember is that these are just cartoon individuals standing in for this definition. In almost every example we look at, it will not be human beings. It will almost always be a molecule encoding a chemical message. So it's important to understand that communication has many different forms. We're going to look at one example from the microscopic world here just to see how that framework can translate across the biological system. The example we're going to look at is mating in yeast. Yeast are a single-celled fungus that can reproduce both asexually and sexually. The sexually reproductive system in yeast requires two different strains of yeast cells, what we call the A strain and the alpha strain, and this cartoon is representing them here. We can see that we've colored them in different colors, and on their surface we have different shaped receptors. In order for the A strain to interact with the alpha strain, they're going to need to produce chemical messages that they can put into the environment to send information to the opposing strains as to where they are. And we're going to represent those with these little cartoon diagrams. The A strain is going to make this circular molecule and the alpha strain is going to make this square molecule. They're going to put these into the environment and as they diffuse around, eventually the A mating factor is going to interact with the receptors on the surface of the alpha cell and an alpha mating factor is going to interact with the receptors on the surface of the A cell. This is going to cause a change in the yeast cells, and they're going to start to grow cellular extensions that are actually called schmoos in the direction where the message was received from. Eventually, the schmoo on the A cell will meet up with the schmoo on the alpha cell, and they will fuse together which is where fertilization occurs. This is a classic example of biological communication happening at a very non-human level. Biological communication exists across all levels of the system. And moving up several levels, we can look at an example like the endocrine signaling that happens in our bodies as another example of biological communication. The endocrine system is one of the major internal communication systems in our body, and it works through the production, sending, and receiving of chemical messages that we call hormones. This diagram shows the master pituitary gland and hypothalamus of the brain, shown here in red and green in the middle of the brain in the image, and the thyroid gland, which is a gland that's responsible for the production of metabolic hormones that have action throughout our body. These two glands are in constant communication with each other through the production and exchange of chemical messages. The pituitary gland will make thyroid stimulating hormone, which will move through the circulatory system and interact with receptors in the cells of the thyroid gland. The receipt of these messages from the pituitary gland will cause the cells of the thyroid gland to make their own chemical messages and put those into the circulatory system where they can interact with the other cells in the body. This is just one example of endocrine signaling, but it's fairly typical in that almost all of the endocrine signaling in our body involves communication between different glands through the production of hormones that are put into the circulatory system to be received at their destinations. Moving beyond the level of the individual organism, we can see other forms of communication as well, particularly in animals. Animal lineages have highly developed communication systems. These two cheetahs are clearly communicating with each other. I don't know what the message is that's being sent here, but I'd really like to. It's obvious that they are interacting interacting with each other and communicating as a result. 
Animal communication is highly specialized. It's one of the main things that separates animals from other lineages of life, is the diversity of their communication strategies with each other and the way that they get information from the environment. This is because animals have highly developed sensory systems, things like eyes, which are in constant communication with processing organs like the brain. In fact, animals have extensive nervous systems, and one of the main functions of those systems is to sense information from other organisms or from the environment and integrate that information through the action of our nervous system and coordinate responses through the actions of glands and muscles in our body. Other lineages of life that aren't animals do not have as extensive a collection of sensory receptors or the ability to respond quite as rapidly as animals do. But of course that doesn't mean that other lineages of life do not communicate. All lineages of life can communicate information both from other organisms and from the environment. Let's look at a non-animal example of this last type of communication, the communication of information from the environment. And let's look at the example of seed germination. It's incredibly important for the seeds of a plant to germinate when environmental conditions are correct. And in order to do that, the seed is going to need to be able to receive information about those environmental conditions. Of course, seeds do not have sensory systems. They can't see what's going on. So this type of information is going to be conveyed through chemical systems. In particular, two different hormones are at work in determining when a seed can germinate. The hormones abscisic acid and gibberellic acid. And these two hormones work in opposition. Abscisic acid prevents a seed from germinating, and gibberellic acid promotes germination in a seed. In a dormant seed, levels of abscisic acid are very high, and levels of gibberellic acid are very low. But abscisic acid is water-soluble. When a lot of water is present in the environment, abscisic acid will be dissolved, and levels of abscisic acid in a seed will drop down. This, in turn, will drive levels of gibberellic acid to increase and allow for germination. If you consider the fact that the solubility of abscisic acid is due to the amount of water in the environment, and you think about the role that enough water plays in a successful seed germination, I'm sure that you can see how this chemical system conveys information about environmental conditions that are necessary for seed germination to be successful. Now, you may not have thought about something like this as communication before us talking about it here and now, but it absolutely absolutely is. It is absolutely the encoding of a message, in this case from the environment, to the seed in a way that the system of the seed can interpret and use to make a determination about when to germinate. That probably comes really close to sounding like the seed is thinking. It is absolutely not doing any thinking when doing this. It's simply responding to changes in environmental condition as determined by changes in these chemicals inside of the seed. But it is still absolutely communication. Thanks so much for watching our Introduction to Communication in Biological Systems. Make sure you can do the following things here at the end. Make sure that you can explain the universal characteristics of communication and describe how biological systems accomplish this process across different levels of organization. Make sure that you can compare and contrast the examples in this video. Make sure that you can explain the unique features of animal communication. And make sure you can describe how information from the environment is conveyed to the biological system. If you can do those things, you're doing great. If not, that's okay too. Take a moment and write down any questions that you have so that you can get the answers that you need. Thanks again for watching. I really appreciate it. Have a great day.